Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is November 8, 2020. It's a Sunday. And we've had quite an eventful week uh, here in the United States. It was election week. It's a presidential year. Joe Biden is now projected to have won the election with 290 electoral uh, college votes. You need 270 to win. He apparently is projected to get 290. The Trump team is swearing that they are uh, going to fight it in court. They'll fight to the last man, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it's not looking good so far, at least as that goes. So speaking of not looking good, um, things haven't been looking good for a while, particularly since Bernie dropped out. Uh, the Bernie Sanders campaign was a big rallying point for the broader left from social Democrats out to communists and anarchists, other revolutionary socialists. Um, you know, and we've been kind of in this netherworld of like, what are we going to do? The Democrats just pivoted right. And uh, like I said, it has been a big week here on the channel. I've been doing something almost every day. I had my post-election roundup. Then I was on a stream with Ewoks Unhinged. Then I was on a stream with Fellow Traveler. Then I did an interview uh, for my Chris Halali follow-up video. Then I did an interview yesterday with uh, a listener and fellow YouTuber, the Falcone General. Anyway, been talking and talking and talking a lot. And fortunately, I mean, I've just been feeling really restless and agitated. Uh, I've been sleeping poorly the last couple of nights. And I have to say, I woke up this morning with like a renewed sense of clarity and I felt like things really just started dropping into place very clearly. And I feel like I know what to do now for the next two to four years or whatever, uh, short term. So that is what this video is about. I want to share that with you. There have been some interesting developments. You know, so much of this game is waiting, 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 waiting. I mean, the political game, electoral, bourgeois electoral politics. It's just waiting, 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 waiting. Boom. Then you see how everything shakes out. Then you can do something, finally. But until then, it's bated breath, expectation, expectation, anticipation, anticipation. And we're finally there. We finally have some data. Finally. We finally reached the decision. We finally know what's going on. And what we know, specifically, is that although Joe Biden managed to beat Trump, which, like, you know, Congratulations, you beat an orange fascist game show host like who was, you know, had been demonstrating his complete lack of a single managerial cell in his body for like, you know, four years straight. Um, huge achievement there. But the Democrats failed to flip a single state uh, at the state level their way. They lost five seats in the House and they didn't flip the Senate. So. I mean, you're a political party uh, that is claiming a blue wave. They've been claiming a blue wave for a while. It hasn't been showing up. I mean, they did retake the House two years ago. Um, they have been struggling to get the Senate, still haven't gotten it. They've just lost some traction in the House. They're not gaining at the state level. And they did win the White House, but they won against Trump. And they won by running a not very popular right-wing conservative Democrat. There are speeches, as I've said before on the channel, of Joe Biden in the 90s talking about the crime bill in which he refers to the liberals, unquote, in his party, meaning he is not a liberal Democrat. So he's right wing. I mean, self-identified by his standards. So what does this mean? What do we do now? You know, you listening to this channel, you are either Marxist, anarchist or, you know, communist adjacent, let's say you're investigating Marxism. And first of all, kudos. You know, I've been doing this political thing for over 15 years. I came to Marxism, basically process of elimination. Nothing else made sense. And I, and I gave serious consideration to everything else. And uh, I came back to Marxism because, uh, like I said, it was the only consistent thing to be anti-empire, to be anti-austerity, to be for uh, economic democracy, industrial democracy, labor unions, and people actually controlling industry democratically. It's the only position that makes sense. Not leaving capitalists in power means you're not a social democrat. They want to leave capitalists in power, just but just regulate them. Um, it's the only, to me, logically consistent position. And that's what we as Marxists say 
uh, capitalism contains fatal contradictions. There are just tensions within the system that cannot be resolved within the paradigm of capitalism. The, the conflict between the owning class and the working class are just too great. And so capitalism carries this tension within it that eventually must be resolved into a brand new system we call socialism, s synonymous with communism now. Uh, the, those, those terms from a, to a Marxist mean the same thing. Some social democrats try to take the mantle of socialism and say that their version of regulated capitalism is socialism. That's not what we mean, and internationally, uh, there's, I mean, on a global scale, socialism and communism really more properly are Marxism. Okay, so I said I had answers. I have answers. I actually pulled a lot of things together for this. So a few thoughts, first of all. So, like I said, Democrats didn't have the greatest election. They got Trump out. They still don't control the Senate. They didn't really make any major gains at the state level. And, of course, they had a lot of losses during the Obama years at the state level. So they're kind of just barely scraping by. I mean, they at least didn't get embarrassed by Trump yet again. But Well, at least not yet. It's not totally over yet, <laughs> at least according to the Republicans. But uh, anyway... You know, let's assume, though, for the moment that Trump gets out, I mean, you know, gets out of the way, doesn't show up to the inauguration, although I would find that on one level hilarious. Um, but, you know, they get Trump out and then things are as they appear to be with the election results so far. Uh, point number one is that Trump did not come out of a vacuum. OK, the Tea Party started in 2008. And before the Tea Party, there was the Minutemen in 2006 and other. I mean, there have been right wing militia groups for decades. Uh, go back to something like Ruby Ridge. I mean, Waco is kind of like a religious cult slash right wing militia. Um, the Oklahoma City Elohim uh, City compound that Timothy McVeigh came from. I mean, these kind of neo Nazi cells have been all around the country for a long time. And. The United States is a reactionary country, by and large. There's a huge base of reactionary people. So we had, most recently, the Tea Party in 08, the birther movement. Donald Trump came out of primarily the birther movement. That was like his first big claim to fame. He And he rode that all, really all the way into the White House in one form or another. So that movement, I mean, you can remove Trump from the White House. That movement is still there. And guess what? This wasn't the last election. 2022 is right around the corner, and then the beginning of the 2023-2024 presidential primaries and election is right around the corner after that. So anybody thinking that this is some kind of like a done deal, stable point in U.S. history, this is the exact opposite of that. This is a novel things are happening all the time. Uh, on, on a grassroots level, people are massively suffering, discontented, hungry, homeless, uh, or housing unstable, food unstable. Uh, people of color are being targeted violently left and right, LGBT plus people, etc. Vulnerable people across the board are being targeted and made even more vulnerable economically or in other ways. So there's massive, massive unrest. I mean, we saw explosive uprisings all across the United States just a few months ago. That pot, that pot, I think, is ready to boil over again uh, soon. I mean, really, uh, if the Democrats do do a shutdown, which they should do, I imagine as soon as people don't have to go to work again, they're going to be back out in the streets, which I, I can't I can't wait to see that um, because I think I think we need it. I think that's the only thing that's really going to get us any semblance of change. Uh, people can. It's a huge morale booster. I mean, people can network with each other and actually start working on things like real things come out of that struggle that you just can't get talking on an Internet forum. Now, we should do the talking. We should read the theory. We should read the history. But at the end of the day, the action is where the stuff happens. You know, we do the other stuff so that we're acting in an informed way and that we're coordinating our action. But uh, you know, at the end of the day, we need action. It did die down, but I mean, we had months of sustained uprisings and protests. That's not going away. This economy is not going to get any better. Capitalism is in decline. The U.S. has for two decades been pushing hardcore military invasions and imperialism just to keep itself afloat. That's going to burn out. So like this system, the whole U.S. ruling class is just showing uh, basically, they they just want to keep doubling, tripling, quadrupling down 
you know, renewal, renewal, renewal of this strategy of tension, strategy of violence, strategy of empire. And it's taking a toll. You can't sustain that forever. I mean, they're already really pushing it as it is. You know, the the tension and the terror and the uncertainty that you right now as a working person listening to this broadcast feel in your life that your loved ones feel even, you know, your your less class conscious relatives and friends and, and loved ones. You feel that fear. You feel that uncertainty because you're living in a society that's collapsing. And the Democrats don't talk about it and the Republicans don't talk about it, except for the more, you know, fringe or working class elements within it. But the the party leadership, which is controlled by the one percent, they stifle all those concerns. They say everything's fine. We're going back to normal. That is basically what Joe Biden ran on as a return to normalcy. Dude, the country is falling apart. There's no return to normal. There's no return to normal. People wouldn't have elected Trump if they felt good about the way things were going. Uh, and the 1% wouldn't have you know, been doing the ultra-nationalist, quasi-fascist push that they were doing with Trump if they felt like capitalism was you know, safe and sound. They turned to fascism when uh, you know, capitalism is under distress, basically. So... These are all signs of, you know, uh, danger, danger up ahead. And the entire one percent, like I said, is just like doubling down on the strategy of more austerity, more police state, more war and empire. And, um, you know, it's going to come apart at the seams. So the right wing is still there. We'll get to the left wing. That's going to be most of this video. But the right wing is still there, uh, even if Trump gets outed. They're going to be still electing Congress people. They're going to be putting up crazy senators and they will make another run at the White House in 2024. That's not going away. <laughs> like all these people didn't suddenly become or they're not going to become Democrats because Trump got elected. They're really not. Joe Biden doesn't appeal to them in many of the same ways that he doesn't appeal to you. Uh, I mean, these people are racist, closed minded assholes for the most part, but you know, they tend to have more in common with you economically than they do with the 1%. And they know Joe Biden is not going to do anything for them, really. So those dynamics are going to stay in, pl in place. That conflict is going to still be going on. So I see tons and tons of liberal gloating uh, about, you know, suck it, MAGA and like cope. That, uh, that's, that's the big popular one right now is like cope. Wow. Sick burn, bro. We'll see where you Democrats are at in two or four years when you keep fucking losing House seats, when uh, maybe you lose even more control in the Senate, et cetera, et cetera. Like there's no reason to gloat. Joe Biden is not a win. All right. Speaking of gloating, they're not restricting their gloating to the right, who, again, I, I submit is still still there, still dangerous. I mean, it's like uh you know, you're fighting off like a, um, you know, I don't know, a pack of wild boars. And like you manage to flip the leader onto his back. And then that's not the time to like hold a <laughs> celebration party. Don't pop the champagne. The entire rest of the herd or whatever you call a group of wild boars is like still there and they're still charging at you. OK, nothing fundamentally has changed here. You've, you've embarrassed their leader temporarily. That's all you've done. Uh, so that is, you know, centrist liberals, Joe Biden, Democrats attitude towards the right right now. What's happening on the left? Well, already, and you can see this all over Twitter and other social media, that Joe Biden Democrats are already gloating about their win. And specifically, they're saying that the left and movements like Black Lives Matter almost cost them a win. But actually, the exact opposite is true. And we're going to get into that. So uh, I've seen this firsthand. People saying that Joe Biden won the White House because he didn't win, uh, run on a left platform. And he said that in the debate against Trump. Joe Biden said that in the debate against Trump. He said, I beat the socialist. I'm here because I'm not a socialist. Bullshit. You're, you're there because you ran in a rigged primary in a party that's controlled by the 1%. We had stories on this, how they were, you know, they found flash drives in Texas full of votes that just weren't going to get counted. They had uh, like whole postal crates full of um, mail-in ballots. And I think it was Wisconsin. The Democratic primary was a sham. Uh, Bernie won the first three states 
And then that's never not resulted in that person becoming the nominee. Clyburn steps in. Joe Biden sweeps Super Tuesday, which is mostly states that Democrats don't win in the general. So it's kind of irrelevant. OK, uh, so that clearly is the Joe Biden uh, Democrat stance. They're going to attack the left just like they're attacking MAGA. That isn't good because we are disgruntled the same way that MAGA is just on an emotional level. But unlike MAGA, we actually have class consciousness. We are clear eyed about the situation. And we're we're, uh, you know, unlike MAGA that wants to scapegoat ethnic minorities and, you know, sexual and gender minorities and racial minorities like instead of doing that, we're actually going to the source of the problem and identifying capitalism. But they don't they don't want it either way because because they are the capitalists. So they don't want us attacking them. Uh, but they are going to come after us. You'll re- recall a few weeks ago, Joe Biden said that the, you know, quote, anarchists, meaning anyone protesting in Portland, uh, you know, they should just all be arrested. And like, that's going to be their approach. OK, Democrats are not going to be any better for the left in the streets at all. And like I said, they're already attacking us. So side note, socialists in the United States, we see on the screen here, Vosh. Vosh, I did a whole almost three hour video uh, picking apart, you know, Vosh made this terrible, terrible argument that uh, Marx and Engels and Lenin and Mao would have wanted you to vote Joe Biden. A- absolute travesty of a quote mining didn't even read your own fucking <laughs> bullshit like none of the quotes he even quote mined like supported his own position it was a it was horrible but then then we have him complaining about the result like dude that's what you were out there shilling for own it you wanted biden you got biden you're not pushing biden left you you just aren't i mean we need things like ending the war shutting down the empire improving our immigration policy, closing the concentration camps, reuniting families. We need a shutdown to end COVID-19. There is a pandemic raging. Okay, we need a shutdown. That's the only thing that worked. We need to pay people to stay home. We need stimulus. We need pandemic unemployment assistance. We need enhanced aid. We need rent and mortgage forgiveness, not for second homes and things like that, but for people's apartments and first, you know, primary residents and for their uh, small businesses, you know, because many small business people, you know, they make in a struggling business, you might make 20, 30,000 and you might have a lot of debt with the business. I mean, they're, they're working people, even though they do own some capital. Um, we need rent and mortgage forgiveness. We need Medicare for all. We need comprehensive, free at the point of service, you know, subsidized national medical insurance. We need it. We're in, we need it generally, but we especially need it in a pandemic. We need student debt forgiveness and more broadly, other kinds of debt forgiveness. We need medical debt forgiveness. We need a living wage, which is $20 an hour now to start. All right. I mean, already 15 is like already a thing of the past. I mean, if minimum wage had kept up with the times, it would have been like twenty two dollars a couple of decades ago. I think back in like the 90s, it would have been like 20 plus dollars in the 90s. We're not even remotely close to that. So forget 15. We need fight for 20. And pretty soon it's going to be fight for 25 because that's how much more expensive things are getting as the economy falls apart. We also need card check. So that, okay, you got your living wage by mandate, but you also need the ability to form a union easily in your workplace. What is card check? Card check is uh, the the normal process of getting a union in your workplace is you get people to sign A cards, authorization cards that say, I authorize XYZ union to represent me in collective bargaining. Well, card check is if you take those cards, hence card check, and you get uh, a majority, 50% plus one, of the workers in your proposed bargaining unit, the, the, the union, you know, whatever uh, branch of your workplace, whether it's the whole workplace or your department, your bargaining unit, if you get a majority on the day, then you just bypass the need for an election down the line. Right now, even if you hand in uh, A cards from like 75% of the people, you still have to wait like a month or two for the government to come in and hold the union election. And what happens right now is that on average, about 30 or 40 percent of that support gets whittled down because the employer, even though it's illegal, 
will use that period to terrorize union activists, fire them. And so basically, like the big unions like AFL and stuff, uh, affiliated unions, they um, won't like do a campaign unless they get at least 70 percent the first time. Uh, with, you know, it's and it's that much harder to do. It's that much harder to get people that many people to sign a cards off the bat because they know that they're going to lose like, you know, 25 percent or more uh, support in those intervening weeks. So if we had card check, all you got to do is just get 50 percent plus one on the day. Boom. No need for an election. And this is a policy that would make many more labor unions in the workplace. Quick note about that, by the way. A lot of people think about unions and they think about striking. Strikes are actually like the last resort and most extreme action. Uh, I should probably do more videos about labor organizing and labor actions. But just to understand, unions in general are about shifting the balance of power in a workplace away from the boss towards the workers. Okay, You go into a workplace as an at-will worker. The boss has all the power. They set your schedule. They set the wages. They, sit, they have the ability to hire and fire. They can tell you to walk that day in an at-will state if you don't have a contract. A union is about shifting that power. First, you take 5%. You take 10%. You gain more and more leverage as a group so that you, you, you narrow the window of what the boss and the managers can get away with. All right? That's what a union is about. It's not about we, everybody got in the union, now we go on strike. There are many, many other actions. There's slowdowns. There's just other kinds of pressure you can put on the boss. I mean, you can just have everybody start disregarding a policy. And if you've got 20 people just disregarding it, there's not like a whole lot that they can do. That's not a strike, though. You know, strikes are risky. Uh, they really are kind of a last resort in many ways. So uh, that's when things break down. But so just so you know, for anybody who hasn't been in a union, really like striking is not the goal per se. Uh, there's many other, uh, you know, lower intensity forms of conflict that you can have with the boss as a union, et cetera. But until we get something like card check, it's practically fucking impossible to start a union right now. It's very, very hard. It's, it's not impossible, but there, there are high barriers to forming a union. Labor law in the United States is drastically skewed against workers. Right now, 50% of workers would like to form a union, yet only about 7% of union, uh, workers in the private sector are in unions. That tells you that policy is keeping us back. So, all right, moving on. Those are things we need. Those are things that Joe Biden is not going to give us. Joe Biden is already crediting his victory that he didn't do those things. Like that, he, he basically is taking it as a mandate. You know, just like George W. Bush, like, got like, whatever he won with in 2004. He got like 50.1% of the vote. And he's like, we have a mandate. No, you don't have a fucking mandate. Oh, boy. So uh, basically all those things I just listed, you know, anti-empire, pandemic survival, increasing living standard. Um, Joe Biden is saying I won because I didn't. So don't even ask me. So are they going to move left? No, they're not. We need to make those demands and we need to put it on record that those are our demands. That's what we asked for, both to put them on the spot and also to rally more people to our cause because we'll say you would benefit from these things. You know you would. Come join us. And that's how we build the movement. But as far as moving Biden left, yeah, not likely. So that is actually uh, right now getting into the, the heart of it. I have an article here from the New York Times talking to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So let me bring that up. So this article is titled Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on Biden's win house losses, and what's next for the left. The congresswoman said Joe Biden's relationship with progressives would hinge on his actions. And she dismissed criticism from House moderates, calling some candidates who lost their races sitting ducks. Go read this article. I'm going to link to it. This is a key article. Like I said at the beginning of this, I asked what is next for the left after Bernie. AOC, I think, who I, I had really... Uh, I was very, very skeptical of. I feel like I am pretty much on the same page as AOC at this point. And this is actually really encouraging to me. What have we been saying is Dems are your class enemy. Dems are going to screw you over. And we need to not be so focused on 
short-term wins, like winning elections, winning immediate concessions. That type of thinking, it's short-sighted, and it's going to lead to Vosch-style opportunism uh, and uh, forming alliances with people who are going to sell us out. Now, I'm raising my hand. You know, Bernie Sanders fucking sold us out, okay? Uh, We need to, as far as the long term, and Jason Unruh did a video about this that uh, I liked. Whether or not you want to embrace Maoist third world theory in in toto, uh, there is a good point that the U.S. is probably going to be one of the last places to like have a socialist revolution, regardless of what the trots say. I mean, for Trotskyists, it's all about, you know, not real socialism unless it's in the Western advanced capitalist countries. Yet we haven't really seen a single revolution in a country like that. It's more in the developing world which kind of leads to the theory of like, well, we need to resist empire and, uh, you know, try to prevent harm from the first world to the third while we build our communities, let revolution, you know, and and encourage revolution in the third world and then try to hold out until it spreads here to the first world. I mean, it's not sort of what the original idea was that, you know, the most advanced capitalist countries would hit socialism first. But it's historical. It's what we're seeing. So we got to go with that. So back to the AOC article here. She sounds to me like she is on the precipice of realizing that no fucking change is possible within the Democratic Party, which is what Marxists have been saying for I don't know how long. I mean, Engels fucking wrote it in like the 1860s, okay? We know that the Dems are your class enemy. Howie Hawkins did a great pamphlet. Uh, I put it up on the channel called The Case for an Independent Left Party. AOC seems to be coming around to it in this interview. So let me just get into it. This article, November 7th, uh, Asteed W. Herndon is the author, updated November 8th. So for months, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has been a good soldier for the Democratic Party and Joseph R. Biden Jr. as he sought to defeat President Trump. But on Saturday, in a nearly hour-long interview shortly after President-elect Biden was declared the winner, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez made clear the divisions within the party that animated the primary still exist. And she and comment, this is, of course, the 1% owns the Democratic Party. They own it through donations. Just look at OpenSecrets.org. You can see all the people who were formerly a registered lobbyist for some corporation. That's who the Democratic Party is. It's fucking corporate America, okay? It's billionaires. That's why the Bernie Sanders thing was key. They don't take PAC money. They don't take billionaire money. I think that that needs to be the baseline for whatever the left is doing moving forward in terms of making some kind of a, uh, you know, a, a party going forward. We have a few parties now. We have the Green Party. We have PSL, et cetera. Uh, there needs to be a, a, a coalition part, you know, that brings these different groups together. And one of the baselines of that group needs to be no corporate money, which I think you'll find it towards the right wing of the Social Democrats. You'll get some resistance. That has got to be clear. And groups like DSA, frankly, need to stop endorsing Democrats. But let's let's get on with the article. And AOC dismissed recent concerns from some Democratic House members who have blamed the party's left for costing them important seats here in 2020. Some of the members who lost, she said, had made themselves sitting ducks. These are edited excerpts from the conversation. So the first question to AOC, we finally have a fuller understanding of the 2020 results. What's your macro takeaway? What's what's the big picture? AOC says, well, I think the central one is that we aren't in a free fall to hell anymore. Comment, I mean, you got Trump out. Let's Let's not overstate it, but... But whether we're going to pick ourselves up or not is the lingering question. We paused this precipitous descent. Comment, yeah, maybe. Biden is embracing Kasich over you, so let's see. And the question is if and how we will build ourselves back up. We know that race is a problem, and avoiding it is not going to solve any electoral issues. We have to actively disarm the potent influence of racism at the polls. But we also learned that progressive policies do not hurt candidates. Comment, in other words, the exact opposite of what the Joe Biden Democrats are saying right now. Every single candidate that co-sponsored Medicare for All in a swing district kept their seat. We also know that co-sponsoring the Green New Deal was not a sinker. 
Mike Levin was an original co-sponsor of the legislation, and he kept his seat. I'm going to come back to this article, but I actually want to go right here to some AOC tweets. So right here we have uh, the first one about the candidates who won. Every single swing seat House Democrat who endorsed Medicare for All won re-election or is on track to win re-election. Every single one. Clap emojis. And they, they were currently running the numbers on the Green New Deal. Uh, she also has three tweets here that there are folks running around on TV blaming progressivism for Dem underperformance. I was curious, so I decided to open the hood on struggling campaigns of candidates who are blaming progressives for their problems. Almost all had awful execution on digital during a pandemic. Comment, i.e. when everyone's stuck at home just reading the internet. So the whole progressivism is bad argument just doesn't have any compelling evidence that I've seen. When it comes to defund, meaning defund police, and socialism attacks, people need to realize that these are racial resentment attacks. Comment, thank you for saying that. That We need somebody in the public spotlight saying these things. Fuck Bernie for stepping out of the spotlight. You're not going to make that go away. You can make it less effective. How do you make it less effective? Invest in year-round deep canvassing. Data shows that this kind of work, comment like DSA is doing, helps blunt the force of racial resentment at the polls. If you're always running away from convos about race, then the only people owning it are the GOP. You will lose. Comment, I know not everybody watching this channel is on board with 9-11 Truth. Uh, I have some videos up on my channel. There's a six-hour, three-part video. Watch that. I feel like there's it's conclusive. 9-11 was a right-wing effort to get the U.S. Uh, involved in a major, major imperialist campaign that, that in fact, 20, 20 years later, they're still on. But I said the same thing then. I remember having a conversation with a liberal, and I'm like, listen, you either take this issue and you take the broader anti-war movement, or the fucking right-wingers and neo-Nazis are going to, and the libertarians and paleocons absolutely did that while the liberals went to fucking sleep. So AOC is absolutely right. It's just depressing to me you know, to see somebody 10 years younger than I am, like, again, it's reinventing the wheel. We need to s just start building momentum and not, you know, keep starting over every fucking five years. Lastly, from AOC, anyone saying this after immigrant, oh, well, and she's quoting a stunning statement from Biden surrogate John Kasich, quote, first of all, Biden surrogate John Kasich, the man who closed half the abortion clinics in Ohio. Quote, the Democrats have to make it clear to the far left that they almost cost him this election. Fuck you, John Kasich. Fuck you to everyone in the Democratic Party who thought that John Kasich was a fucking good idea. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Right now, people are going hungry and homeless. People are living in fear of eviction, fear of losing their job, fear of catching COVID, fear of spreading COVID. Fuck you. You want to talk about compromise? Compromise is we haven't fucking come for you all yet. That's fucking compromise. The working class of the United States is being pushed up against an absolute wall right now. We're being forced to accept terrible conditions that are getting worse all the time. And we're being forced to accept a future in which the planet is being destroyed. I mean, nothing less than, let alone, even if, you know, take climate change out of it. Like, we're going to be back to work camps in, like, another, you know, 30 years of this shit keeps up, if even that long. It's bad. I mean, plus, you know, I mean, I say we're going to be back to work camps. I mean, I haven't worked at Amazon. It doesn't look fun, though. So I, I don't mean to, like, sell short existing conditions. It's fucking terrible. I mean, all right, anyway. So AOC responds to the John Kasich thing. Anyone saying this, that like, you know, the, oh, the far left almost cost you a victory. Anyone saying this after immigrant organizers delivered Arizona, black grassroots flipped Georgia, which was huge, Michigan going blue with reality bending 94% Detroit margin and Rashida Tlaib, one of the squad, running up the margins in her district and Trump publicly challenging Ilhan Omar in Minnesota and losing isn't a serious person like there people, you know, elevating people like John Kasich who are spitting in the faces 
of the left, many of whom, you know, against advice from people like me, they did help. They did hold their nose and they did get Joe Biden elected. What's their thanks? Their thanks is fuck you. That's their thanks. Well, I say fuck you right back. This is class war. That's where we're at. And it seems to me, and I think you may agree by the end of this interview, it's clear AOC has fucking like really started to lose patience with these people. So question to your first point, Democrats lost seats in this election where they were expected to gain them. Is that what you are ascribing to racism and white supremacy at the polls? AOC, I think it's going to be really important how the party deals with this internally and whether the party is going to be honest about doing a real postmortem and actually digging into why they lost. Because before we even had any data yet in a lot of these races, there was already finger pointing that this was progressives fault and that this was the fault of the movement for black lives. I mean, comment just it's an insane position, but that's fucking Joe Biden. That's Kamala Harris. OK, this is somebody who wanted to keep California inmates locked up so that they could fight fires for free slave labor. I mean, this is somebody who didn't prosecute Steve Mnuchin. This is somebody when she was attorney general in California, let the banks have people's houses during a foreclosure crisis when things were being fraudulently robo signed. OK, that's who the Dems put at the top of their ticket. And just incidentally, as far as, you know, left parties and third parties, I think people should protect their communities, get uh, people in, you know, Greens, whatever, independents elected to your city councils, like county government, if you can, even county governments like pretty tightly controlled. But do what you can. Try to protect your communities. Do mutual aid. Do whatever you can to resist empire locally and, you know, take care of your people. Right now, these things at the higher levels are like, I think it, you're totally impenetrable. So, you know, in many ways, who we voted for for president, it's like it's impenetrable. And that's even assuming, a, you know, a fair election where they counted the votes. I'm not I'm, I'm not sure that that happened. But OK, getting back to AOC, I've already started looking into the actual functioning of these campaigns, meaning the, the ones that were lost. And the things is, I've been unseating Democrats for two years. I have been defeating DCCC run campaigns for two years. That is the Democratic Congressional Caucus, something or other. It's like the conservative, more conservative. It's like the DNC, but specifically for Congress, the DCCC. Uh, and, and when she says she's been unseating Democrats, meaning working with Justice Democrats and rallying support for in, uh, people trying to primary incumbent 1% Democrats. I've been def defeating DCCC run campaigns for two years. That's how I got to Congress. That's how we elected Ayanna Presley. That's how Jamal Bowman won. That's how Cori Bush won. And so we know about extreme vulnerabilities in how Democrats run campaigns. Some of this is criminal. It's malpractice. Connor Lamb spent $2,000 on Facebook the week before the election. I don't think anybody who is not on the Internet in a real way in the year of our Lord 2020 and loses an election can blame anyone else when you're not even really on the Internet. And I've looked through a lot of these campaigns that lost. And the fact of the matter is, if you're not spending $200,000 on Facebook with fundraising, persuasion, volunteer recruitment, get out the vote the week before the election, you are not firing on all cylinders. And not a single one of these campaigns were firing on all cylinders. So comment. Basically, these people have the audacity to turn around, be like, oh, it's the far left's fault when they didn't even fucking try. They had unpopular policies that they were running on. And they didn't even fucking advertise in places that people were looking. I mean, that's a whole separate thing about uh, Cenk Uger on TYT talks about this a lot. Uh, I mean, he's like mired in all this electoral Democratic Party stuff. But he talks about how their party is like held hostage in part by um, the political ad people. These campaign managers who like they get paid no matter what. <laughs> so, you know, they can run ineffective campaigns and it really doesn't. In fact, the harder, you know, the, the more money that gets sunk into them. Uh, the better. So it's like, you know, uh, if they lose so much, the better, because then they'll just, you know, their expertise will be needed that much more the next time, even though you might think, well, they haven't won anything for us. But apparently that's not how it works in reality. I would go. I mean, of course, that's an interest group attached to this. I would go way beyond that and say, generally speaking, uh, <laughs> It's like the team, the Washington Generals that always used to play against the Harlem Globetrotters that would always lose. The Democrats are paid to lose. They're not just like a free entity operating on their own. 
They're controlled by 1% corporate money through the donations, and they're paid to lose. They'll win when they really need to to like maintain the illusion. But by and large, they are there to not be loyal to the working class base. They're there to be loyal to corporate America and the 1%. And, and that is why we see these outcomes. So continuing, uh, New York Times says, well, Connor Lamb did win. So what you're saying is investment in digital advertising and canvassing are a greater reason moderate Democrats lost than, than any progressive policy. And AOC says these folks are pointing toward Republican messaging that they feel killed them. Right. But why were they so vulnerable to that attack? If you're not door knocking, if you're not on the Internet, if your main points of reliance are TV and mail, then you're not running a campaign on all cylinders. Comment. I got, I don't know, 60 things in the mail. They went straight into the recycling bin. I don't want this fucking crap in my mailbox. OK, I don't think anyone does. So back to AOC. I just don't see how they can be making ideological claims when they didn't run a full fledged campaign. Our party isn't even online not in a real way that exhibits competence. And so, yeah, they were vulnerable to these messages because they weren't even on the mediums where these messages were most potent. Sure, you can point to the message, but they were also sitting ducks. They were sitting ducks. There's a reason Barack Obama built an entire national campaign apparatus outside of the DNC. And there's a reason that when he didn't activate or continue that, we lost House majorities because the party in and of itself, does not have the core competencies and no amount of money is going to fix that. If I lost my election and I went out and said, this is moderate's fault, this is because you didn't let us have a floor vote on Medicare for all, and then they opened the hood on my campaign and they found that I only spent $5,000 on TV ads the week before the election, they would laugh. And that's what they look like right now trying to blame the movement for black lives for their loss. Comment, I could not agree more. The question is, what do we do? Do we keep trying to reason with these people or what do we do? So it goes on. New York Times, is there anything from Tuesday that surprised you or made you rethink your previously held views? AOC, the share of white support for Trump. I thought the polling was off, but just seeing it, there was that feeling of realizing what work we have to do. We need to do a lot of anti-racist, deep canvassing in this country. Because if we keep losing white shares and just allowing Facebook to radicalize more and more elements of white voters and the white electorate, there's no amount of people in color, of color and young people that you can turn out to offset that. But the problem is that right now, I think a lot of Dems' strategy is to actually avoid working through this, just trying to avoid poking the bear. That's their argument with defunding the police, right? To not agitate racial resentment. I don't think that is sustainable. There's a lot of magical thinking in Washington that this is just about special people that kind of come on down from on high. Year after year, we decline the idea that they did work and ran sophisticated operations in favor of the idea that they are magical special people. I need people to take these goggles off and realize how we can do things better. Comment. It's like it's like the Russiagate thing. It's like Russian elves came in and sabotaged everything. Well, may, or maybe the fucking Republicans like got out there and did the work and you fucking didn't and you ran on trash and you fucking lost. Maybe that's it. It's like Hillary Clinton sitting there, you know, why aren't I ahead by 50 points? You're not doing the work. You're not connecting with people. You're not resonating with people. The Republicans are out there doing the work. I mean, they're doing evil work. They're not doing good things, but they are doing it and they're getting results and you're not. And you're not getting the results. That's why Hillary Clinton couldn't fill a high school gymnasium for most of her fucking rallies, while Bernie Sanders could fill stadiums without even trying. Okay. Continuing with AOC, if you are the DCCC and you're hemorrhaging incumbent candidates to progressive insurgents, you would think that you may want to use some of those firms that are running the progressive insurgents. But instead, the DCCC banned them. The DCCC banned every single firm that is the best in the country at digital organizing. And I'd like to step away from the New York Times article for a second to just get into what is she talking about. So here's an article from In These Times, uh, how the DCCC's blacklist could blow up in the Democratic establishment's face. Um, 
basically what happened here is, and here's another one, blacklisted political consultants profit from Democrats' civil war. Um, basically, the the DCCC decided that, hey, we don't like that Justice Democrats is, you know, has formed this uh, progressive interest group to try to primary incumbent do-nothing corporate Democrats. What was their response? Rather than adopt some of those positions, which they work for the 1%, they absolutely don't want to do that. They're right-wingers. They fucking blacklisted the advertising agencies that were working with Justice Democrats saying that they... that. Uh, uh, if you, I believe what they said is if you like hire any of these firms to work on your uh, campaign, the DCCC will not give you money. To which AOC said here, uh, the DCCC's new rule to blacklist and boycott anyone who does business with primary challengers is extremely divisive and harmful to the party. My recommendation, if you're a small dollar donor, pause your donations to DCCC and give directly to swing candidates instead and then she went on to list she said some great ones and started a thread there on twitter so you know that is uh what's going on there (laughs) rather than try to adapt and like you know actually win they would rather dig in at being right wing and just lose and lose and lose because again that's what the one percent pays them to do they are paid to keep the left the working class from ever rising up that's been going on for decades. We're now finally at a tipping point where we can do something. This is where Revolution 2030 comes in. I just did a video on this. This is where we Marxists, we in the far left, need to hammer for 10 years. And I think we can get something going by by 2030, if not sooner. But I think 2030 is a decent goal of uh, all-out internet influence campaign and see what we can do. But So back to the AOC article now. AOC continues in her answer to this question, saying the leadership and elements of the party, frankly, people in some of the most important decision making positions in the party are becoming so blinded to this anti activist sentiment that they're blinding themselves to the very assets that they offer. I've been begging the party to let me help them for two years. That's also the damn thing of it. I've been trying to help. Before the election, I offered to help every single swing district Democrat with their operation, and every single one of them but five refused my help. And all five of the vulnerable or swing district people that I helped secured victory or are on a path to secure victory, comment probably because the uh, vote tally isn't done yet, and every single one that rejected my help is losing, and now they're blaming us for their loss. So I need my colleagues to understand that we are not the enemy and their base is not the enemy, that the movement for black lives is not the enemy, that Medicare for all is not the enemy. This isn't even just about winning an argument. It's that if they keep going after the wrong thing, I mean, they're just setting up their own obsolescence. So comment here. You might be saying, Esfere, why are you so excited about this? Isn't she just trying to rehabilitate the Democratic Party? Well, she does get into that in the end that she doesn't think that this is you know likely um although that particular quote right there is a little bit more you know i'm trying to help you um we need you know it was a crime that bernie didn't start a labor party it was a crime that bernie didn't start a labor party that ran candidates in the 2018 midterms um but you know he didn't and so the squad is the next best thing here in terms of in air quotes outside progressive force within the Democratic Party that represents some of the things that we socialists can work toward. And I have, you know, titled this video, uh, we need to detach from the Dems. That is, to me, the main thing. We need an independent left party. Um, And I see things like this as, you know, I I mean, I don't believe the Democrats are ever going to listen to her, which is why I'm not overly concerned about, oh, suddenly they're going to get smarter. But, you know, and there is a real naivete here in she's saying, uh, you know, I need my colleagues to understand that we're not the enemy, the base isn't the enemy. Well, no, we, are, we actually are the enemy <laughs> to them because the 1% and the 99% have diametrically opposed class interests. They want more of our labor 
time for less money. They want us to pay more interest. They want us to pay more rent. They want us to pay more of a markup on retail goods. They want more from us, and we want more value for our effort. Those are diametrically opposed interests. She's working within a party that is a capitalist party and represents capitalist interests. That's why, like, you know, I think she's trying to walk this line of like, publicly, I'm trying to help you. But I mean, if she knows anything at all, she should know damn well, like why they're doing what they're doing. So again, why this is exciting to me, we need to get people out of the Democratic Party into a labor party and start a movement towards socialism, which needs to happen outside the Democratic Party. That's why I'm excited, because if AOC tells people to get out of the Democrats, that's hugely helpful. Um, We need that movement to start happening now. I'd love it if everyone listened to me. I'd love it if, you know, everyone listened to other small YouTubers with a thousand subs. It's not going to happen. We do need to capitalize on what's going on in the mainstream spotlight. And here is somebody who is actually saying, like, it's going nowhere. Now, are they setting up their own obsolescence? Uh, They've been able to sustain themselves this long. Until we form an independent labor party that is a coalition of Green Party and PSL and like IMT or whatever other, you know, socialist alternative trot groups, like until we form that coalition and start working on this stuff, uh, they're going to have free reign. But um, again, where do we go after Bernie? This could be promising if AOC gets out of the Dems or otherwise represents the next step in this whole, you know, attempt to totally transform the Democratic Party, as, you know, Bernie wanted us to believe. So back to the article, she goes into this a little bit more. New York Times says, what is your expectation as to how open the Biden administration will be to the left? And what is the strategy in terms of moving it? Comment, I mean, not likely, but here's what AOC says. I don't know how open they'll be, and it's not a personal thing. It's just the history of the party tends to be that we get really excited about the grassroots to get elected. And then those communities are promptly abandoned right after an election. I think the transition period is going to indicate whether the administration is taking a more open and collaborative approach or whether they're taking a kind of icing out approach because Obama's transition set a trajectory for 2010 and some of our House losses. It was a lot of those transition decisions and who was put in positions of leadership that really informed, unsurprisingly, the strategy of governance. And commenting, so Obama ran on hope and change, campaign slogan 2008, then Citibank, you know, like picked his uh, cabinet. He folded that like infrastructure that he had built and the Dems got wiped out over the next eight years eventually with Trump getting elected. And that's where we still are today is they, they run on hope and change and then they crap on your head. And AOC was like part of this effort to, you know, the, the Sanders wave of like, no, you know, we're going to take it back. We're really going to do it this time. It's never worked before. We're really going to do it this time. And guess what? It's not working. And if AOC calls bullshit on this, Please, please. I mean, she basically does in this article, but if she gets more explicit and becomes more of a warrior for this position, that would be a good start because we absolutely need an independent left party uh, to, again, you win elections, you can get at the local level, you pass progressive policy to resist empire and protect vulnerable people. But more than anything else, you have then an organization that is free of 1% money, where working people can actually come together, start getting educated and helping each other out in terms of understanding socialism and understanding where we need to go. Obviously, there's going to be more revolutionary voices within that, like a PSL, for example, that educates people in Marxist theory. Uh, But, you know, those revolutionary like pockets are as big as we, you and, you know, people like you listening to this and people like me making this channel make them get into DSA and start lobbying for more far left and Marxist positions. We make it happen. You know, I mean, don't alienate people, do it intelligently and, you know, persuasively and charmingly, but do it because if you don't, the social Democrats are going to get out there and do it. All right. So back into the article. So the New York times says, 
What if the administration is hostile, meaning Joe Biden? If they take the John Kasich view of who Joe Biden should be, what do you do? AOC, well, I'd be bummed because we're going to lose. And that's just what it is. These transition appointments, they send a signal. They tell a story of who the administration credits with this victory. And so it's going to be really hard after immigrant youth activists help to uh, potentially deliver Arizona and Nevada. It's going to be really hard after Detroit and Rashida Tlaib ran up the numbers in her district. It's really hard for us to turn out non-voters when they feel like nothing changes for them. Comment, they're not wrong. Nothing changes for them. You're not wrong listening to this. Nothing changes. When they feel like people don't see them or even acknowledge their turnout, comment, I would go further when they actually like scold you for existing, which is actually, they're, they're not even just ignoring us. That would be a step up. They're literally blaming us for not doing better. If the party believes that after 94% of Detroit went to Biden, after black organizers just doubled and tripled turnout down in Georgia, after so many people organized Philadelphia, the signal from the Democratic Party is that John Kasich's won us the election. I mean, I can't even describe how dangerous that is. Comment, thank you, AOC. She is speaking truth here, and she's, she's going to get even further into it uh, as these go on. So, New York Times, you're diagnosing national trends. You're maybe the most famous voice on the left currently. What can we expect from you in the next four years? AOC. I don't know. I think I'll probably have more answers as we get through the transition and into the next presidential term. How the party responds will very much inform my approach and what I think is going to be necessary. The last two years have been pretty hostile. Externally, we've been winning. Externally, there's been a ton of support, but internally, it's been extremely hostile to anything that even smells progressive. Comment, externally, that would be us. That would be Most of you listening to this who are not affiliated with the 1% owned Democratic Party, we're the ones who want these things. We're the ones who argue for these things. We're the ones who talk about these things. We're the ones who demand these things. We're the ones who get out out in the streets for these things. It's there. The left wing agitation is clicking, rightfully so. We are correct on the issues. We are correct ideologically with our materialist analysis. We are correct. And yet, as she says, internally, within the 1% controlled Democratic Party, they're just not having it. Back to AOC. Is the party ready to like sit down and work together and figure out how we're going to use the assets from everyone in the party? Or are they just going to kind of double down on this smothering approach? And that's going to inform what I do. Well, commenting, what do you think, S4A audience? What do you think the Democrats are going to do? What did they do to Bernie? What are they doing to AOC? What did they do to Bernie in 2016? What do you think they're going to do? They're already signaling that they care more about John Kasich than they do about AOC. Probably the most popular person in the Democratic Party. After Bernie Sanders, who is like the most popular politician in the United States. They're like, ah, fuck you. (laughs) So I'd be... I don't know Uh, if they did pull an about face and they started, you know, suddenly taking a conciliatory tone towards the left in the couple of months between now and Biden gets sworn in, assuming that, you know, Trump doesn't like nuke the country in the meantime. uh, I, you know, first of all, I wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it's sincere, Um, but you know, I'd, I'd be kind of surprised if that happened at all. They fucking put his vice president, let alone that the president is somebody who like built the police state, was the chief Democratic lobbyist for going into Iraq, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The the president is somebody who built the police state and built the empire abroad, is responsible for the deaths and impoverishment of tens of millions of people all over the world. I mean, hundreds of millions of people, really. That's the president that they put up the vice president again, somebody who stood on stage and literally mocked people who were protesting schools, not jails. She's like, well, we need jails. That's bullshit. So I'd be very surprised if this party had any conciliatory tone towards the left when they've already been openly hostile to the left in the week after the election. But, you know, if they did, I wouldn't believe it at all. 
All right, so back to the article. New York Times says, is there a universe in which they're hostile enough that we're talking about a Senate run in a couple of years? AOC, I genuinely don't know. I don't even know if I want to be in politics. You know, for real, in the first six months of my term, I didn't even know if I was going to run for re-election this year. New York Times, really? Why? AOC, it's the incoming. It's the stress. It's the violence. It's the lack of support from your own party. It's your own party thinking you're the enemy. When your own colleagues talk anonymously in the press and then turn around and say you're bad because you actually append your name to your opinion. I chose to run for re-election because I felt like I had to prove that this is real, that this movement was real, that I wasn't a fluke, that people really want guaranteed health care, and that people really want the Democratic Party to fight for them. But I'm serious when I tell people the odds of me running for higher office and the odds of me just going off trying to start a homestead somewhere, they're probably the same. And that is, of course, where the title of this video came from, AOC says that uh, working within the Democratic Party may, you know, may not be possible or futile. Um, she just laid it out. And let me say, AOC is young. She's in her 20s, right? Um, people on the left came down hard on her, including me, for like not challenging Pelosi more when she came in. And like, I'll stick with that. I mean, honestly, like... That wasn't a good move. I think she got good criticism for it. She's also like a kid. I mean, she, she you know, uh, she, very, very high profile, thrust into a huge spotlight. I think she has, you know, and if you go to her Twitter feed now, she is like, you know, going through the motions of like retweeting Joe Biden stuff. Like she's doing things so that the party can't accuse her of you know, being combative because then, you know, they could use that to justify their being combative right back. But what she's showing is that she has even tried to be nice with them while being critical, but like honestly critical and constructively critical. And they not only don't take any of the criticism, they, they don't even listen to it. And then, but then they like, honestly, like slam her and are super hostile to her anyway. So Bernie showed what happens if you try to run for president in the Dems. AOC shows what happens when you try to run for Congress in the Dems. And AOC is saying in this article, she's like, I don't think it, it, it may not be possible. OK. So, like I said, um, MAG is not dead. 2022 is right around the corner. 2024. I mean, we'll be here before you know it. The 2023 primaries, of course fucking elections take like a year and a half before the actual, you know, November uh, every four years. So, you know, we get just like good more than like the 30 percent of our life, political life in the United States is consumed with elections between the primary year plus and then the election itself. It's just it's like I said earlier, the reason we're all fearing feeling so much anxiety, insecurity, terror we're watching society falling apart and we're not seeing either party with a major response. Justice Democrats was, you know, we can say as Marxists that it was an inadequate response. It was a response that was doomed to fail, but it was a, a response to what was going on that, hey, people actually need stuff. Neoliberalism definitely hasn't been working. All right. And of course, we've dissected on this show the difference between neoliberalism, which is moving away from social democracy that we had from the 30s to the 70s, uh, back towards just laissez-faire, robber baron capitalism from the 80s, 90s, and on. That was the agenda of deregulating, defunding, and privatizing, neoliberalizing. That's what the Libertarian Party is all about, right? That, that incidentally, or perhaps not, arose in the 70s, and then, you know, as they start lobbying, they have, you know, uh, Definitely a, a big moment in the 80s with the, the Reagan administration. And really, it's just been downhill from there. Now, a lot of these social Democrats, they want to go back to the New Deal. They want to go back to the 1930s through the 70s, the kind of golden age of social democracy. Well, two points about that. And I may do a longer video about reasons against social democracy. Like, why am I a Marxist and not a social Democrat? Not for lack of thinking about it. A, social democracy is still capitalism which is still imperialism. It still runs on war. It still runs on third world oppression. 
And it still runs on like massive inequality, even within the country, even if you get those programs going. It's just like a little bit easier to be down and out in social democracy, okay? Which, yeah, okay, I'll take it. I'll take like easy over hard. But it's not a fundamental change. It leaves capitalists in power. But And that leads to point number two, which is that social democracy uh, came out of intense struggle. And really more than that, I mean, of the labor movement and other reform movements uh, and revolutionary movements. But fundamentally, it was a compromise position that the one percent, the FDR branch of the one percent, which he was very much a one percenter and started out very conservative, uh, was from a you know wealthy, very establishment family. They put out social democracy as basically like a compromise because they were afraid of socialism. Like without socialism, we probably never would have had social democracy because they because they can afford to ignore us. So why not just I, I think anyone lobbying for social democracy in t- the 2020s, it makes no sense. We're, we're in a crisis. We're on the precipice of massive change. The data are are there. I mean, this has been stacking up for a while. We need massive change. Why are you advocating for the compromise position at this point? So, all right, coming into the end of this video, I told you, you know, I had solutions. So what does this mean? We see that Bernie's down. The squad is wavering. AOC is up here saying it may not be possible to work within the Democratic Party anymore. Well, they're finding out what we already knew, and they didn't listen to us, but What that means is that over the next two to six years, you're going to see more and more shifts away from the Democratic Party. To everyone listening to this, join a socialist organization, whether it's Socialist Rifle Association, the PSL, IWW, uh, on and I mean, DSA. There's a DSA in most places. Join the Green Party. Do it. Get involved. Network. Meet other people. Start projects. Start unions. Start organizing, you know, and again, if you join something like the IWW, I would say ignore their kind of like utopia. They're very like ideologically anarchist. Uh, Join them and take the organizer trainings. That's practical stuff. You know, form form a tenants union, form a labor union, whatever you're doing. But I would say, you know, as as an ML myself, I think that their theory of revolution is like not good. But that said, you can join any one of the like just like DSA. There's kind of a lot of social Democrats in it. Well, ignore that stuff, but focus on the organizing and do that and push for Marxism. You know, I think a very concrete thing tying in with this story is push to completely disaffiliate from the Democratic Party. DSA needs to stop endorsing them. Justice Democrats needs to contribute to the the formation of an actual labor party. Okay, that Bernie Sanders is fucking criminal. Like Bernie Sanders in socialist hell will be roasted over the coals for eternity for not forming a fucking labor party in 2016 and then running candidates in the 2018 midterms. It's nuts because how much more time do we want to lose? How many more children need to be born into poverty? How many more bombs need to be dropped on black and brown people around the world? How much more do socialist countries and attempted socialist revolutions around the world need to be thwarted and held back and sabotaged by the capitalist West, particularly the imperialist muscle of the United States, which works on behalf of global capital? Like the U.S. is the the muscle, the, 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 the hired muscle, the thug for global capital. They go around the world murdering people and sabotaging socialism. How many more years do we need to watch go by? I'm fucking sick of it. You should be too. Get out there and get involved. Peel everyone you know away from the Democratic Party. Show them this article. And that, to me, is what we start doing after Bernie. And it starts today, and it's going to take different forms. But this shift away from the Dems has to fucking happen. I think it's happening now with AOC talking this openly about it. What do you think? Let us know in the comments. And I'm going to wrap it up there. So thanks to our current patrons, whose names are on the screen. We're up to nine. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. Uh, If you can't afford to support me on Patreon for as little as $2 a month, $24 a year, um, you can just spread this video, comment, share, put it in your Discord groups, Facebook groups, 
spread it wherever you can. Um, the channel has grown a lot. We're up to like 940 something now and growing all the time. Um, you know, reach out if you want to do a collaboration. I am definitely open to that. I've uh, been, you know, like pretty much every day this week I've done a collab. So I think that we need to expand this conversation. And of course, you're going to see more audiobooks from this channel. Uh, actually, one of the things I think I'm going to do, I'm going to do a straight month of audiobooks from just women socialists because, you know, I realize um, I see a, like a lot of male names in the comments and, uh, you know, that's great. I mean, you know, men are half the population, women are half the population roughly, and then there are, of course, people who don't fit neatly into either category. Um, but I see a lot of guys and I would love for that to be more diverse. I mean, guys need a place to like do their thing and express themselves as well. Uh, you know, I feel like in, in socialism, we focus a lot on sort of like the military revolutions and taking things by force and blah, blah, blah. But women are an integral part of socialist efforts too. And uh, I think I just want to spend a whole month like just doing women socialist audiobooks. So look for that coming soon. Thanks. This has been Socialism for All. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment, click the notifications bell, and we'll catch you on the next video. Thanks for listening.